All right, welcome everyone to the RSP Film Room. And we have been off for a little bit of uh, time for the summer. Um, we're going to start this back with a little bit of a uh, look at a player who's making some noise in training camp. And I'm doing that with me today. This week is Joe Holka, 4for4.com. Joe, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Adam. Pretty excited about this. Uh, even the small amount of times we've gotten to sit down so far, it's always been a pretty enlightening experience. So I'm excited to dig into this one. Yeah, this should be fun. So Joe, if you guys aren't um, familiar with Joe, Joe is a writer at 444.com and he has his own site um, and he's doing a really, some really very cool work on um, his site that's entitled Rushing Expectation. And it's something that I'll let Joe tell you guys a little bit more about that. You know, if you could tell us about that project as well as how you got into fantasy writing and a little bit about your background. Yeah, uh, as far as the rushing expectation stuff, it's kind of my version of Matt Harmon's uh, reception perception. Uh, so rushing expectation, basically I wanted to kind of draw the line between where the running back's talent and his offensive line kind of leads them. So what I did was I developed a metric that is called the expect, expected success rate. So it basically takes into account how good or how bad the offensive line play was in front of that player and what their expected success rate would be. So you can basically compare what their expectation is between what their actual success rate was. And I kind of broke that down by different lanes for rushing and for uh, targets in the passing game. And then I'm also charting things like before contact yards and after contact yards. So my initial 20 players that I did, so before I wrote any player up, I I went through and charted uh, six to seven games per player, um, and I did 20 to start. So I'm just in the process of writing up those uh, those profiles right now. I'm about six or seven players in, so those will be coming out uh, right up until the season starts. Excellent, and it is and it is really enlightening work. It's it's fun to see where this is going to go, and getting a chance to see some of the players that that Joe has done and and read. It's it's really worth your time, especially as a fantasy owner. If you're trying to learn a little bit more about, you know, not only about the player himself, but also you know how he works behind the line and how some of these different factors he described really tie in together for your fantasy team. So definitely an educational you know project that i think is going to be fun to see where this leads down the line yeah i appreciate that i know we've talked a little bit about how it's important to kind of blend the the film aspects and then a the little bit of metrics that i have involved as well so kind of finding that fine line between those two things that i think is super helpful yeah i mean all you know really there's so many fine ways to to you know, analysis, good analysis is good analysis, whether it's a, you know, whether it's data heavy or whether it's film heavy or whether it's a combination of both, just finding the right balance of information that is, that actually has merit, you know, comes from both worlds. Um, and it's really not really a different world in itself. It's just it, whether, unless you're just talking about extremes. And I think that when we go to extremes in either direction, it, that's when we start to have some some issues there. Um, but today's player is an interesting one, both on film and both from an, um, you know, maybe from a data standpoint of combine production. Because if you look at Keith Marshall, the, the former Georgia back, he was the fastest back at the combine one of the fastest backs we've seen at a combine, um, and he does it at about at a rock solid 220 pounds. Um, there was a time that when you look at Keith Marshall's career as a freshman, you know, at, as a University of Georgia grad and a, and a former employee there, they, they, that backfield was known as Gershel. They were the, you know, they were that tandem that was imitating Herschel Walker in the sense of the type of impact they had. And many people thought that Keith Marshall might be better than Todd Gurley after that freshman year. And I think a lot of that had to do with his speed. Um, but he was a fine back in his own right. Then he had an ACL tear as a sophomore. He missed much of his junior year due to having some compensatory injuries that happened while he was recovering. And that gave rise to Nick Chubb. And we, and you know, if you ask Leonard Fournette, Leonard Fournette said in his freshman year, Nick Chubb outplayed me. 
you know, in terms of being the best back in the SEC. And then Chubb went down, and you had Sony Michelle. And Sony Michelle, Michelle was the higher recruited player than Nick Chubb at Georgia. So you can see the bounty of riches that the University of Georgia has had with running backs lately. And what's going to come for the fact that Keith Marshall, who was still dealing with that injury and coming back, ended up being relegated to number three on the depth chart um, by his senior year with Chubb being the Heisman candidate. Sony Michelle is the guy that that uh, Mark Rick said was the best offensive player on the team. And then and then you're, you're dealing with, you know, a very good Keith Marshall, who's you know, arguably, who was arguably in the same plane as Todd Gurley at one point in their eyes, you know, being number three. So that's who we're going to watch to set the scene here. But he's already making noise in camp, you know, and that's the thing that I kind of thought it would be fun for us to watch him post-injury against Kentucky and talk about what we see and then maybe compare some of that tape to some pre-injury highlights and see some differences in scheme see the differences in maybe if there's any differences in athletic ability or what else we can glean from some of those highlights that are worthwhile. So uh, that's what we're going to do. Yeah, that should be great. I think uh, looking at the difference between pre-injury and post-injury will, will kind of shed some light on what people are kind of looking at today. So, Yeah, should be good stuff. So, I mean, we're going to we're going to do that. And for those of you unfamiliar with the RSP film room, it's just going to be two guys studying tape, talking about what we see um, from the standpoint as the of a player, the position and just the game of football in itself. You know, we're going to watch things mostly in slow motion. Um, we're going to rewind a lot of plays. There's going to be dead air in this. This is not, you know, a highly produced concept you know, this is really more of a study session and we just put that on tape and have people watch it. And, and, you know, it seems to have a pretty nice following of people who, who like to like that for what it is. Um, so before we get started, just let everybody know that the videos posted here on the RSP film room are not hosted on the server and that the original video content is not considered to be property of the RSP film room. Um, the videos are considered to be used under the fair use doctrine of the United States copyright law, title 17, U.S. Code sections 107 through 118, and that the videos used here on this site um, for editorial and educational purposes only. That's how they're used, and that the RSP Film Room and its staff don't any claim any ownership of the original video content, and the RSP Film Room staff um, do not use the video clips as advertisements, marketing, um, for any direct financial gain. All the video content in each clip is considered owned by these individual broadcast companies. We're just doing, you know, we're basically taking cut-ups from Draft Breakdown, a fantastic site, and reviewing that information. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen and make sure that Joe and I can see what we're going to be watching here in a minute. Let's see. There we go. And... Can you see what I'm showing up here, Joe? We we good yeah. to go? Okay, good. All right. Then let's get our let's get started here. I'm going to start in in half speed just to make sure that um, that you can see that it's not too jumpy. And if it gets if it's better another way, let me know. We'll give it a, another try. We'll give it another look in terms of uh, speed here. Yeah. Let's all right. So, I mean, right off the bat, one of the things that's fun to watch about this particular is to understand a little bit about the offense that Georgia uses. And we'll see this a little bit later on when we watch Keith Marshall as a freshman. He played in a lot more of a shotgun oriented system or he ran a lot more from shotgun um, as a freshman. As a senior, we're watching him run as a single back or an eye back in a much more pro traditional pro look of an of an offense and we're seeing right here in this particular in this particular look right off the bat we've got about oh about eight men in the box already in this particular play and another defender creeping up high enough that uh you know you can see that they're already stacking the box out of this eye
and not an auspicious start for Mr. Marshall. You, you know, you can see, you know, he slips cutting back here, but it's interesting just to note even decision making here. What's he, you know, what's he looking at? He's got two double teams, one going to the middle linebacker. And you can see that he's already pressing the crease a little bit downhill and trying to cut back. So conceptually, it wasn't a bad decision. It just didn't, it was just poor execution. And I don't think this had anything due to the knee, Joe. I just think yeah. it's a, he just slipped on the grass. <laughs> he, just he had his head up at least. So at least he knew where his head at least. Yeah. All right, so moving on. We have another seven-man box, maybe arguably eight right here. If you, depending on if this safety starts to climb a little bit more. Another fullback lead and a cut back through a crease. And that goes for a nice eight-yard gain right there. Yeah, a little bit of yards after contact too, so. Oops. So, I mean, again, you have, you know, it's a pretty traditional run, kind of an inside zone look with a fullback lead, but it's a nice, it's a pretty deep press. I mean, he's, he's about two, maybe one and a half, two yards from the line of scrimmage before he makes that cutback decision. He's quick enough to get through and he nearly beats this free defender who's a cornerback right there. I mean, that, you, you got to understand we're going in slow motion, but the fact that he almost beats a cornerback through a hole is a pretty good display of burst for, a, for a running back. Inches away from pride breaking that too. Yeah. And this might be the story of Keith Marshall's senior season is that he was often inches away from breaking long runs. And I think people often saw that and said, well, he's not as fast as he was due to the ACL tear. And then the combine kind of blew that out of the water. I think more than anything, you're looking at him, we're going to see this later on, is a lot of the highlight plays he made were against six and seven man boxes or less. And in, and in passing looking formations oftentimes or spread out. So right off the back, we see that he's a pretty sophisticated with press and cut concepts right off the bat. Look at this one more time. Anything you notice here, Joe, that you're like that stands out to you even about this run? You know, it's just that first cut. It it does seem pretty explosive though. His just agility behind the line seems pretty above average. But that, that you talk about that burst, and I think that's what you notice even in slow motion on some of these plays. Yeah, I mean this this defensive tackle has a pretty nice angle across the face of his guard, and ha and. Marshall's able to, you know, dip away from it and then cut downhill very fast. And while he only gains a yard and a half, you know, he's quick enough to avoid getting wrapped in the backfield here. Using kind of that outstretched arm too to kind of gain a few extra yards of there. Yeah. That's a that's a nice notice there for sure. It's always nice to see players with active arms in terms of as ball carriers, you know, that they have the coordination and the strength and the, and, and really the timing to use it. I was watching a player yesterday at, at wide receiver by the name of Cooper cup from Eastern Washington, who's like about 195, 200 pounds, but he had a phenomenal stiff arm. It was just, it was, it was a beautiful thing to watch. Is that something you see normally translate to the program? Yes. If it's timed, if it's good with timing, 
because if you have good stiff arm timing, you you kind of understand where the placement's supposed to be, and it's an active you know it's an active component of the game. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I think it translates pretty well. So again, good cut decision based on that outside contain coming downhill and kind of buzzing off that that edge blocker. He knows that he's going to have to work way around here, and that's not a smart move. So he tries to get downhill. But in this case, he's, he's just, you know, this cut back inside is met very well by our linebacker cutting through what about right? On that backside, this backside linebacker, and it's and it's a tough deal because you can see this this lineman seventy three. He's got really two choices. He's taken the outermost man, which is the smartest thing, yep. but it's two on one here. That's a pretty nice play by that defender, also. Yeah, and I think Marshall does a good job trying to set up this by going downhill and kind of pressing inside and dipping outside hoping he can he can get the hand on there but his placement isn't great you know it's like on the top of the shoulder which isn't bad mm -hmm. top of the shoulder side of the head but the defender's getting low enough here that there's no way yeah, yeah. But we'll see that stiff arm again, I have a feeling. <laughs> Doesn't seem like... What's that? A little bit of power for the first yeah. time. Yeah. What do you like about... I mean, what do you like about that right there? Or what do you... Or what's overrated, <laughs> underrated to you? He's a pretty, I mean, he's a pretty big back. I, I like his agility so far, but taking on a, a lineman like that that's so much bigger than him but still getting an extra two or three yards after he gets hit, even off of a play where he didn't really have much of a hole to go to, I think that's nice when he's falling forward like that at least. Yeah, I mean, he makes this a four-yard gain after a one-yard wrap. Mm -hmm. And do you think... I would, you know, I don't know about you, but I look at this and I think, okay, he's 220. And he makes this little jump, this little hop and burst right. downhill. And the impact, you can see the the impact he makes on 69 here, this nose tackle or defensive right. tackle. Upon that contact, I think that burst and that size with the pad level, mm -hmm. you know, that's a... We were talking about the last time it's those first couple steps out of a cut that are the most important thing as far as someone's burst. If they can kind of get their center, center of gravity low quickly, like that's such a huge thing as far as their power going. And like for how big he is, I think that's, that's a great point. Yeah. And, you know, this is important on first and 10. If you can do this type of work in the NFL on first and 10, you can if you can create second and sixes and third and fours or you know you're you're doing your job as a running back between the tackles so here we are again one two three four five six seven and then an eighth man creeping in. yeah creeping in so not much there <laughs> I mean, that penetration's already two yards mm -hmm. deep, now three. And he still makes it miss. Yeah, I mean, if you're getting touched two yards after you get handed the ball, if you can make at least one guy miss, I think you're probably doing your job there, too. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense. You know, one of my one of my favorite examples has always been Matt Forte at Tulane playing LSU's top defense with Dorsey as the star and watching him have a game where he probably didn't even get like 
12, 13 yards in the game, and he was still impressive because of being able to make that first man miss, that yards before contact. Yeah, that elusiveness behind the line is just something that you see. Even like a guy like Jamal Charles, like his elusive, like his before contact yards every single year are just insane. So I'm yeah. sure Matt Cortez are also very good. Yeah. And you look at, and a part of that's, you know, again, look at the footwork. Look at the smaller steps he takes there before he cuts downhill. He's, he's good at varying the pace and stride of his runs so he can read what's going on. And instead of him trying to bounce anything outside because he sees this outside defender on 73 getting free, he's just like, let me just ram it up in here and just drive. And he's able to push for about another yard. I mean, that's that's better than that's better than no gain at all. It's just yeah. maturity. Just allows that offense to do so much more if he's taking what's there, at least on early downs. Yeah, and here we are at you know, here we are in you know, inside the fifteen. Get what you can, just push it closer. You're you're in a compressed area of the field. Quick decision making matters. It's just it's just smart play, and he's getting bent back a little awkwardly. I don't think we're going to see any issues with you know if he wasn't healthy. I think we'd be a little bit worried about that, but all right. So we got our we got our first kind of pistol look right here. Nice block in front of him there. Yeah. Is that stiff arm? Yep. <laughs> That's for sure. And it's aimed well. I mean, it's a. I think you get called for a face mask probably in the NFL on occasion for that. But he gets it just enough into the pads. He just shouldn't yeah. have hung on to the, to the face mask yeah. there. <laughs> That's, he would have gotten called for that. But... Mm -hmm. Good awareness, good balance. The speed and balance. Yeah, and just the flexibility. I mean, we we one thing we don't talk about with athletes enough, I think, especially football players, we always talk about their strength and their agility, but we don't talk about flexibility. I know, yeah, I didn't mention it earlier, but I used to play professional hockey actually until this year, and hip flexibility – is so underrated. You see so many guys now in the off season just doing yoga, just because hip flexibility not only was helping your skating in general, but it's just like all your power from just kind of getting that leverage low. Is just it's so much of it is how flexible your hips are. Yeah, and to adjust like this, I mean, your back and hips need to be pretty flexible, even even right here. Yep. All right, so you can see, let's see if we can uh, move forward a little bit here. All right. All right, we've been through this play enough. Let's see if we can get move on a little bit. The SEC was getting highlight happy there. I think this is the same play. Yeah, it looks like a different angle. Yeah. Yep, so good catch, good run. Let's move on. Now we're, you know, now we're in garbage time basically here at this stage. But still, a lot of these plays you're seeing are seven, eight man boxes. You're seeing him make good decisions with his cutting. Makes a nice sharp cut here, and he's aggressive. I mean, you like the fact that he's willing to be reckless at this stage, especially for someone who supposedly is still dealing with an injury. Yeah, I think, the game's out of hand. It's third down. He just doesn't have much in front of him yet. He's still looking for contact or at least not shying away from it. Yeah. So to me, this was a good sign that here's a guy who's healthy. <laughs> even gets even gets a little extra from the defensive tackle landing on his leg. Sometimes you need that, though, coming back from an injury. It's – it's about taking that first hit or even that first big hit to kind of in your head be like, all right, everything's going to be fine. Yeah. 
And I like the ball security here. I mean, this is a this is a place where you know you're getting thrown in the air, and yeah, it's a little bit loose there, but he's good at trying to keep you know trying to hang on there and pull it tighter as he's in midair. So someone you can see there's some awareness there about trying to keep the keep the ball secure and keep it high and tight. Once again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in the box. Yep. And look at that one cut. That small crease. Yeah. And that's what I love about this guy is he is a good small crease runner. He waits. He waits until he's about a yard and a half away before he makes that cut back and squeezes through. That runs burst. through. Yeah, that burst is there. He ran through rep. He, if that second rap wasn't there, he's gone. You make a good point. He, he had the patience to be almost to the line of scrimmage before he made that cut instead of kind of just ramming it behind it where his offensive line was. Yeah. And again, this is an eight-man box. And that's, you know, he makes it look pretty simple and smooth. And it's not like the lines move back that much. We're at the mm -hmm. line of scrimmage here. They haven't, while the defense hasn't reset the line of scrimmage in the backfield, we have one player who's downfield yeah. for Georgia. Yeah. This is an even, evenly matched line of scrimmage. Again, probably. Very close to breaking even a bigger run there. Yeah. He breaks his touch there. Yeah. It's the second arm tackle he miss, he gets wrapped on. It's not the first one. Yep. And you can tell he's like, man, <laughs> I <Yeah>. so want. <laughs> Chops right up. Yep. What are we at? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe nine in the box. He doesn't make it, but again, he see him spotting cutbacks. He's trying to read and get closer to the line. I mean, he's, and you know, it's one cut and then a second dip downhill. He thought he had that lane. But that was a, not a bad adjustment to try and even just get get away from 21 here. You think he could have made it to the outside of 88 there? Or, or would you rather see him kind of just stay through that middle if he saw a hole? I, see, that's the great question. I was going to ask you the same thing because, you know, if we're looking at LaShawn McCoy, Jamal Charles, you're going to see them probably bounce that out, out the back way. Even Matt Forte could do that. Mm -hmm. And that's what made Matt Forte an underrated special back. Um, I just don't know if I don't know if Marshall has that kind of agility. Yeah. He's much more of a one cut guy. So for me, the fact that he's like, look, I'm not going to get too fancy. I'm just going to get downhill here. And I think I can beat 21. Yeah. I think that's what he's thinking is that he, he sees that guy and he still thinks that he's going to be able to get the first down. But yeah, you make a good point about his agility he is kind of more of a one cut guy. At least that's what we've seen so far is kind of getting that balance back to actually be able to get up to full speed. Isn't something that he's doing super quickly, at least laterally. Yeah. And let's remember game situation. Cause it's like, is he, is he going to take a ton of chances? Yep. It's third and five They're They're in territory that they can, if he gets the first down grade, if he doesn't, they're going to be able to pin Kentucky way back in the, in the corner of the end zone. If they, if they execute well as a punt and they're ahead by 24, this is probably a conservative play it safe kind of situation. Yeah, that's a good point. So, 
So here we are again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And maybe even the safety, if you say the box is inside 10 yards. Probably not, but we'll say eight. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty nice. <laughs> it's just, again, like those small creases. He's, for a big guy, he's finding those pretty easily. Yeah. He beats, the, he beats this yeah. guy down the pursuit lane. So he beats a corner. He beats a linebacker. He beats a defensive. I think that's a defensive tackle in, back there. And then he generates, oh, I don't know another couple yards there yeah he, he's working through those those first kind of arm tackles pretty easily and then at least when he's, he's finally stood up he is getting some more kind of yards even after that through like some pretty nice power yeah and it's very decisive i mean like once he finds he's in he's pressing and he sees that that backside collapsed inside and he's right through it wow i mean this is a that looks fast in half time. I was going to say it almost doesn't even look like it's in slow motion at times. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's kind of fun to watch. I yeah. I don't think I've, I mean, I forgot about this. I haven't watched this in half speed in quite a while, but that's pretty, it's pretty darn fast, man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't look like a guy, at least so far, that is coming off of an ACL injury, or at least that people were that worried about it. Yeah. So I mean, this is Keith again. This is Keith Marshall post injury. Mm -hmm. This is this is late round, sixth round pick Keith Marshall, who, you know, again, looks like a starting running back to me in college football, despite the fact that he's oh I don't know the number three guy on this team. But I suppose, you know, Edron James at one time was splitting time with Najee Davenport and Clinton Portis. So you see a lot of players in college. It's a lot of it is about your situation and what the coach thinks of you, what guys are ahead of you, what kind of uh, draft or what kind of college pedigree they had coming in that that kind of stuff really matters in college i know yeah. when i was playing college hockey like there's so many guys that people will never hear about that maybe didn't have the stats in college but there's some pretty amazing players that just never really get a chance absolutely you know and i remember when i first came to georgia as a student there was a there was a guy a heisman candidate by the name of garrison hurst and there was this transfer student um who who played with George Allen by the name of Terrell Davis and Terrell Davis looked good every time he was on the field he just couldn't stay healthy either but look at this he comes up on the safety lowers the boom yeah. another three yards that's nice good pad level mm -hmm. and that decisiveness and speed paired with good pad level and size that's some pretty stuff so let's watch him a little bit beforehand here um, once we get through our commercial here that I didn't cue through. So this, you know, this is unintentionally brought to you by Geico. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but let's watch a little Keith Marshall. And again, these are highlights, but this is just going to give you a chance to see some of his big runs. And we're going to do this in slow-mo. And see the difference between what we just saw as a senior in that system versus, I mean, we don't want to see you, buddy, versus uh, what we're seeing here. So, again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We got eight in the box here, and we do have an eye formation on this run. Again, look at the cutback, just like we saw. This one's actually even further behind the line because the line's being set back. And the footwork there is pretty fancy. Yep, it's another one of those arm tackles again.
And he doesn't even look like he's moving that fast. That long separation. That... Yeah. So there we go. That's a very similar play to what we saw against Kentucky. He just was he was able to make that second man miss and then and fully accelerate. Now let's see this one. Let's see if we can look at what the if there's any difference in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in the box, single back set, no tight end. Give him a big crease like that and forget it. Yeah, he wasn't even touched. Yeah. And he doesn't have LaShawn McCoy cutting, but we've noticed two nifty little moves while he's accelerating where he can kind of bend away, like right here, and set, you know, kind of anticipate that angle and get away. You say that those, those kind of bending angles like that is even more important for a guy whose agility isn't maybe as good, but he has that long speed, so as long as he can kind of find that angle, he's still going to be okay. Yeah, I mean, I think this is – Darren McFadden had this skill when early in his career. Um, the difference – and I would even say that Keith Marshall is very much a Darren McFadden-like runner, except he's what people thought Darren McFadden could be because I think he has better pad level. He has better patience. He could run a – he runs much better in zone schemes, whereas McFadden couldn't read zone schemes very well. And so you're looking at a guy who often plowed into players, um, whereas with Marshall, you're seeing a lot more nuance to him, you know, pressing and cutting back and finding open lanes immediately. So I would say, you know, skill, physical, yes, it's very important that it's nice to have that kind of bendability or to be able to alter your step, side, step rate and your step um, length so that you can change direction, and he does that. Um, and you pair that with good vision. You kind of compare him to even like a Tevin Coleman in that way too, just for Coleman's not as successful as far as like a zone scheme, but he does have that long speed. Yes, and, and I would say Coleman is also a good comparison. If Coleman can develop, again, better skill playing the zone schemes, even though he played an outside zone in college, you could see that, Atlanta went to a gap scheme last year when they used him yep. because that he was much he was doing what McFadden was doing. So yep. th there are very there are similarities stylistically. You would just probably say that Marshall's maybe a little bit more advanced stylistically in terms of his scheme versatility. Yeah, if Coleman was one of the guys that I that I charted in kind of that first group and he reminds me he reminds me a lot of Keith Marshall so far. Yeah, and just kind of his speed, but not necessarily uh, kind of what he thinks or kind of how he thinks behind the line. I guess that that's where their difference would be. Yeah, and just footwork. I mean, look at this move. This is crazy. Like it's it's nothing. It's nothing unbelievably agile when you think about jump cuts and spin moves and crazy stop starts. But look at how he gets his guy to lean with this step. And yep. it's in the hips. It's in the hips and that and that change in step length where he bends inside, shortens the stride, a little jab step with the with one foot and then back out. He's I mean, making those moves and he's really not even losing a ton of speed while he's doing it. No. They're very efficient. I mean that head fake. That's a wicked little move right there. Here it comes from this angle. Look at that juke. I mean, <laughs> he. I mean, yeah. Obviously, obviously, Sports Center was impressed, you know. But uh, but we'll look at it from this angle one more time. I mean, like he's setting him up from like ten yards away. That's good, and that's the kind of footwork that you saw in the hole against Auburn on that first play on this highlight 
where he makes a little bit of a move, beats the guy up the middle, and then he's gone. Mm -hmm. So now I've got a traditional sweep, which should be a nice play for someone of his speed and turns that corner easily. It's one of the first times we've seen him kind of get a play designed for towards the outside too. So, Yeah, because you'd think, oh, he's just an outside – he's probably just an outside runner. Again, we're looking at a shotgun set, but we have more of a power formation here with two tight ends, mm -hmm. another eight-man box. And then it's well blocked. I mean, you get when you get a lane like that, that's huge. But don't give him a lane like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's noteworthy, though. You keep saying he's facing all these loaded boxes because – at least, maybe not even necessarily this season, but long term in the next couple of years in Washington, those receiving options that they have there, like he's not going to be facing a, load, a loaded box all the time, like kind of what he has been in college. No. And once again, if there's a consistent theme that we're seeing is he's reading – that safety as soon as he's in the hole and he sees him from 10, 15 yards away. Look at him get through here and then watch this cut coming up right there. He was seeing, he saw the safety. We didn't see it for sure, but he's right through here and you know he's like a huge hole. He sees the safety he's like, okay, let me dip away. Setting guys up like that too is such a big part of being an open field runner, at least on the second level, too. It, yeah. This might be my favorite play I've seen him, him make. He works out to the, to the right. Aaron Murray throwing deep. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. All hands. Yeah, it's a nice adjustment on this, too. I mean, it's a back shoulder play, really. Makes that look very easy. There's receivers who don't make that look easy. Yeah. And here's the, here's the football porn moment here. <laughs> that was nice. Yeah. And he's got and and his thumbs wrapped on this play too. Oh so, right, yeah. Yeah. So he's making this fingertip catch while he's got one hand wrapped up and obviously injured. Mm -hmm. So here we are, another I one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine in the box. And this is just more great scheming. Put him out on an island against two guys. But look at that cut. Wow. That's that's a little better than what we see from a from the two guys you just mentioned. Yeah, that one move. Yeah, that's pretty. Now we got a gap play, and he hits that nice and hard. A nice little dip. He had that dip past the linebacker here. Once he right here, where is he dipping? Right here. Eight yards before the guy. Yeah. So do you worry ever watching kind of like these highlights and stuff? I know we're trying to kind of prove a point, but. When you're doing the RSG stuff, if, if you, is it ever kind of cloud, like seeing one or two like real big plays, does it ever kind of cloud your overall analysis just from kind of looking at it from these highlight perspective, or are you trying to kind of keep it cumulative just on what you see in total? I try to keep it cumulative. I only look at, and it's a great question because I don't look at highlights very often when I'm watching players. He just had so little tape on him yeah. that it was like, what – what do I? I looked. For, I looked at Penn State. I looked at um, Kentucky. I looked at a three, three or four other games. But then, what I wanted to see was, you know, I saw, I saw him. I looked at those games and thought those were him at his worst. 
Yep. You know, he didn't have huge – he didn't have any huge breakaway runs. Um, you know, and I'm looking for situation more than anything else. Like, is he facing eight-man boxes? Is the is the play blocked well? Like a good example, we were at 235, and we'll look back at 235. But look at this play. He should be stopped Yeah, right here. Like, this is a well-defended play. Mm -hmm. He should be done. So you're looking at more the situation than anything. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking at I'm looking at down and you know, I'm looking at decision making. I'm looking at you know really the quality of what's going on in the process more than I'm looking at the at just the end result. And sometimes highlights just show if a highlight shows a player, you know, what's a good example? Like some the uh this play. This play is impressive in that he's fast, yeah. but we know that already. Yeah. But to me, it's like, yeah, sure, there are eight men in the box, but what I'm impressed most about this play is how well Georgia blocked it. Mm -hmm. exactly. You know, this, if you're going, oh, look at this, this is an example of how good his vision is. I'm going to say, no, that's not a good example. That's a good example of him following great blocking. But yeah, if you, I, I remember at least when I was being recruited, um, for college, like they don't necessarily want to see a highlight tape. They want to see full games and they want, cause they want to be able to get an idea of what the situation situation was like, what the score was, what period it was when you're yeah. making those plays, not just how many goals you got on the power play. That's exactly it. And, and that's exactly how I feel when I watch stuff. But if I have to watch highlights, then I'm very careful about what I'm looking at there because I'm not going to sit there and, you know, because these are all – but here's the same thing is that you can look at all quote-unquote good plays yep. and you're still seeing um, – how would I best put it? Sometimes good plays don't necessarily mean good process and don't mm -hmm. mean, you know, good good plays in terms of how they project to the NFL. Yep. But a lot of what we're seeing on this highlight tape is a guy making really good decisions – and showing good footwork and good cutback ability, and yeah, yeah the whole the process in general, as far as just the overall result, we're looking at things way before the, that even happened. So, the, yeah, that's exactly right. Because look, in the NFL, most likely this is a four-yard game. Mm -hmm. You know, because this guy's this backside guy is this guy right here is probably not going to overrun it this wide yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and it probably gets stopped about right here and he pushes forward another yard or two instead you know we're looking at about a 20 yard gain here mm -hmm. but this would have been probably about a, a five or six yard gain in the nfl which still you'd go nice cutback yeah, exactly. That process that it took to get there. It doesn't really matter. Those extra 15 yards you got in college, you're still going to have a pretty nice play in pro. Yeah, and that's part of seeing the NFL game, you know, kind of trying to see the college game through the eyes of an NFL game. So, and again, this is, this is freshman Keith Marshall. This is a guy who's who forced a split with Todd Gurley. This is a guy who couldn't couldn't see the field because Nick Chubb <laughs> dominated as a freshman <laughs> and he got uh -huh. hurt. Have you seen him at all in pass protection? That's a good question. I have, and I've seen him take on I've seen him take on um, linebackers and defensive tackles. I have to look at my notes to be for sure how I how I studied him, what I saw in him. But um, let me see if I can, while this is playing, I can look some of that up and see what my notes had to say. I mean, there's some nice power there. Oh, yeah. I mean, look at that. We got, now obviously, that just the pad level and lean. He sees the end zone. Yeah. So from what I have in notes with Marshall as a blocker is that 
He was consistent diagnosing his assignments. He's, his hand placement is good. He's got decent footwork. He just has to improve his punch, and I didn't see him cut block. Okay. Is that something that they can normally improve on? Yes, absolutely. Because your punch is really about timing and rolling your hips into blocks, and you're not really – that's something that just takes some effort and work to do, and it's not addressed a ton um, there. And cut blocking is something usually running backs are good at <laughs> or, or try and work on first and foremost because it's, you know, you're not having to face people down. So the fact that he was already stand up blocking is a very good sign. And I just, and again, nice little head. He's got a nice little shake before he uses any type of downhill cuts with the shoulders and the head there. Yep. Does he switch arms there with the ball too? Yeah. Yeah, he might have. And I would say he doesn't have a great stiff arm, but it seems to be fairly functional and active. His, his placement needs a little more work. But yeah, I mean, so far... You know, this is this is a reason why, you know, if you look at if you look at him as a as a decision maker, where I think he may struggle in the NFL early on, if at all, is he may need to press a little bit closer to the line of scrimmage than he is right now. I mean, like he's doing it very well for a college back. Like most college backs, their press and cuts are like three to four yards behind the line of scrimmage. And Marshall is already at the one to two yards away um, in a lot of cases. So yeah. that's a good sign, but he may have to go even a little deeper. But I think he's, I think if he struggles at all, it may just have to do with something like that. Um, yeah. But we're going to see, I wouldn't be surprised at all if we see him show well this weekend. Yeah. Um, I almost wish we would have done this before I, I wrote up Matt Jones like two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> so any any sneak preview thoughts on Matt Jones while well, since he brought well, him up? I honestly don't think he is as bad as people think. Um, from an efficiency standpoint, a lot of people, their argument is based on yards per carry when I think a statistic like success rate is a lot um, more predictive. Um, he was actually better against uh, eight or more in the box than uh, less than eight in the box, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, his overall expectation was better than quite a few more t highly touted guys that I've charted so far. So they might have gone a little bit too far on him, in my opinion. But Keith Marshall, that's, you never know. I'm liking what I see so far. Yeah, but that's a good point about Matt Jones, and that's worthwhile. I mean, because, you know, again, we also have to give him room to improve as a player, you know, yeah. between year one and year two. Here's him making – here's a good one of Marshall making a nice little dip away from Clowney. Oh, about, oh, I don't know, three yards in the backfield. Yeah, okay. Another second cut that's pretty nice. I mean, look at that. That's – for a guy who's not Matt Forte, LaShawn McCoy as, as a change of direction guy – he has some pretty sweet moves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Like you mentioned, kind of yard before contact. There, I guess there's different ways to kind of do that. There's there's ways to do that with agility and elusiveness, but there's also different ways to do that as far as kind of how you bend your angles as well. Yeah. And you use your speed. And that bend is a lot with the hips. Like you talked about the hips there. Look at how his hips – Look at the angle in which he's able to kind of swivel one way and the other. Because that takes some that takes some strength and flexibility in your hips to make this kind of a dip back inside like that. Yeah, this might be way off base, but as far as these football workouts are concerned like a lot of squatting a lot of legs like that stuff's really hard on your hips too for so guys that can kind of keep that flexibility over the years of training to just kind of get their their lower bodies where they need to be like there's a lot of guys that lose flexibility doing those type of workouts so it's nice when you see a guy that's as big as him still be able to have that flexibility in his hips i think that's really important yeah 
Absolutely. So that's our that's our look at Keith Marshall. We can say goodbye to Aga or Russ or whoever that is now nowadays. But uh, yeah. So I mean, th he's an interesting player. He's someone that you can see why he might be a bargain as a six round pick, um, and and why he may carve out a niche at some point. Maybe not this year. Maybe not with this team. But uh, but he it's why you know I it, it's you get to see some of the compelling reasons why even his senior year was impressive despite the absence of long runs. Yeah, I think what we saw from him even after his injury is more encouraging than anything. I think a lot of people are super worried about that as far as his speed, but he put that combine number together after his injury as well. So maybe people are just totally kind of overstating that at this point. Yeah. I mean, you get a chance to see a guy who, you know, when you're beating – cornerbacks with angles through holes um the players who probably have the best burst on anybody on defense um you know probably when you're just looking from a size standpoint that's a pretty good sign that you still have explosion and that you haven't lost much um if anything at all so yeah. so yeah so this was definitely a fun show um Again, folks, you can check out more RSP Film Rooms at the YouTube channel, RSP Film Room. You can check out Joe Hoka's work at 444.com, as well as give him the, the address for your website. Uh, it's uh, predictivefantasysports.com. Predictivefantasysports.com. Definitely keep an eye on this. This the His rushing expectation series is definitely one to, 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 keep, to keep reading and to see how this progresses. Um, definitely excellent work. So uh, for Joe Hoka, I'm Matt Waldman. Thanks again and see you all next time.